Hello, Houston. <clears throat> We're sitting here arguing about how far we got last time. I'm just going to launch because it's my course. Hopefully it'll be in the right position and we'll go on from there. We were, I believe, in the middle of talking about the need for control. I was talking about the fact that there are two major things that, that really set science apart from other ways of, of contemplating and gathering knowledge. One of these was the use of, of operational definitions, as we talked about last time, and the other is the need for control. When we do a controlled experiment, I'm going to put a very complex visual on the screen for you as it is there now. We talk about populations which we're going to study, and I'll come back and define these for you later. We randomly assign subjects from that population into one of two groups or multiple groups. We apply a procedure, whatever our experimental procedure is, we measure the dependent variables as we talked about it last time. We summarize the data, we compare experimental and control, and then we make a decision. Going through those steps is where we need to use statistics in a variety of ways, and that's most of what we're going to be talking about today and some of the next program. In terms of doing those kinds of comparisons, as indicated in the diagrams in, in your simple psych book, one way to do that research is to do what is called a between subjects comparison, where we in fact compare one group with another group. You remember the other day we were talking about um, experimental research in, um, in trying to determine the effect of temperature on ability to learn. Once you've learned the material at any given temperature in the room here, you can't do it again at another temperature because you're no longer naive. So in that case, we'd have a separate group like yours to take it at 70, another at 40, and another at 10 degrees, and so forth. And then the comparison would be between groups, this group versus this group. The other kind, and I think that's what we may have been talking about right at the end, is what's called a within groups comparison, where in essence what we do, if we wanted to determine what kind of weight uh, will cause you, what kind of system will cause you to lose weight best, we're going to use a within groups comparison. Um, and in, the reason being that we'll have a base rate where we establish what you're eating normally is over a two week period. Then for two weeks we're going to have you weigh yourself every morning after you've showered and before you put any clothes on. You'll simply weigh yourself and, and write it down on, on a sheet on the mirror. And for two weeks we'll just have you weigh yourself and record the weight. Next two weeks, you go back to base rate again. So we reestablish what your base rate is. Then we have you write down in a notebook how much you've eaten. 1117, piece of gum. 1203, Coke. Um, 1217, fried egg sandwich, or whatever, and so forth. And you carry a notebook with you in your purse or your, your hip pocket all the time and write down everything. Then we, two weeks of that, then we go back to a base rate for two weeks, reestablish what your weight is. Then we put you in a sandwich board. You know, these two by four things with leather straps that you walk around that says on it, I'm on a diet. If you see me eating, ask why. And that's the way you're going to walk around for two weeks. And so we'll try that technique. The point is, in this case, it's a within subjects comparison because of the fact that we don't care where your weight is when it starts. What we're interested in is, relative to that weight, how much does simply writing down your weight have as an impact of causing you to lose weight? How much does writing everything down in a notebook have? And how much does walking around with a two by four sign hanging off your body have as an impact on causing you to lose weight? So we really don't care where your weight starts. What we're interested in is what is the relative weight loss that we achieve by each of those techniques? It may be that wearing that two by four sign is so personally humiliating that um, you just don't want to, um, you don't even want to be associated with that and it causes you to eat even more. So maybe just carrying around a notebook and writing everything down. Doesn't matter because it's a within subjects comparison. You and I serve as our own control in that kind of an experiment. Now let's look in general at the research techniques that we use for actually collecting data. And there are several that we're going to talk about in terms of research methods. The first of these is what's called naturalistic observation. Naturalistic observation has as an advantage that you can actually see nature in the raw. You see nature essentially functioning au naturel. Um, you don't actively manipulate it. You simply stand by and observe. So the advantage is that, that the subjects don't have to cooperate. The, the organisms that are being studied don't have to cooperate. In fact, they don't necessarily even know that they're in a study at the time. The disadvantages are, however, that you have to have an extraordinary amount of patience. I went over to the Houston Zoo one day to get a picture of, of a gorilla not doing something indecent, and it took me four hours of sitting there watching that gorilla before I got a shot that was publicly displayable um, of him simply eating something. Um, so in fact, one of the difficulties with naturalistic observation or field research, as it's sometimes called, is the fact that, that um, it will, it doesn't, it's very expensive to do, and you have to be very patient. 
Another possibility, another type of research that we can talk about is what's called the case study technique, also called case history. Um, this is what clinicians tend to do. They will use um, clinical observations of you. They will essentially interview you one on one. Um, and the advantage of this technique is that we can personally adjust it to any of, of the several different techniques that we wish that we wish to um, that we wish to do. Um, in in um, in in conducting the, the interview. The disadvantage is that it tends to yield unique data. And unique data basically is not ultimately of interest to a scientist in most instances. What we're looking for are generalities. So if we know everything there is to know about you, um, it may not apply to anyone else. And so in that case, the data is somewhat limited. So the, the broader issue with case study technique is the difficulty in being able to, to generalize from that data to others. A third possibility is to conduct um, instead a survey. Surveys are very valuable as, as a kind of initial survey device to figure out where the, where the major variables are. The advantage of a survey is that it, you can do a quick and dirty study. That is, you only have to run a, have one good set of questions developed, and that can be a problem, and then distribute it widely and collect the data. But in that advantage lies the primary disadvantage, and that is that surveys generate huge amounts of data. And so you have to be prepared with, with human power to process the data afterwards. Um, with electronic questionnaires, we can handle it more easily. We can feed it into computers. But it tends to be a very expensive technique in that it generates a great deal of data. And you have to be worried about the, the particular uh, sampling technique that you've used. A fourth technique that we can use is correlational research. Um, and in, the, in that case, um, what, you're, what you're utilizing is, is well, Dick Evans on our faculty a number of years ago had a multi-million dollar grant in studying smoking behavior. And one of the earliest studies that he did was to go out into the elementary, middle, and high schools around the, around the city here and, and do a, essentially a medical study of, of several hundred students um, and ask them a number of questions. And he was after things like their height, their weight, their race, their sex, uh, their systolic and diastolic blood pressure, all manner of different things were factored in. And what he ultimately did was to set up a major correlational study where he looked at each individual variable and the likelihood that it would occur in a given situation. So if, if a variable on this side occurs, what does it co-occur with in the, um, in the situation there? That can be a very good way for identifying not cause and effect relationships, but at least instances of co-occurrence. And then you can follow up with a more traditional study to try and identify if, if varying factor A, in fact, influences the variability in factor B. And finally then, the last major technique for developing uh, research data is to, um, is to conduct experimental research. This is the traditional lab-based analysis um, that is involved here. Um, the advantage of this is that we can very precisely replicate um, phenomena in the laboratory. The prime, so it, it has the advantage of, of eliminating extraneous variables and allowing us to hone in on very specific factors, independent variables, and to present them with replication very precisely um, many times. The primary disadvantages are, or is, um, that the lab doesn't really represent real life. You and I don't tend to spend a lot of time locked in a room with a tape recorder and a microphone uh, and nothing else. And so the net result can be that, that it's a little bit sterile. And again, you have problems generalizing sometimes from the lab into um, the, the, or out to real life. So there, there are both advantages and disadvantages in this, in this kind of a technique. Now, any time we're conducting data on any of those particular um, means, by any of those means, there are two major error sources that we have to be careful of. One of these is what we call demand characteristics. If you happen to have a research assistant who is strikingly attractive and buxom, and she walks into the office of the research director and says, my research indicates that males have faster heart rates than females. Or if you have a ruggedly handsome male assistant who walks in and reports to the research director, my research indicates that females have a faster heart rate than males. There is what is called a demand characteristic that is creating that particular effect. It's something ancillary to the research that is nonetheless part of the research environment itself. So we have to be careful about um, demand characteristics. We have to try to control them in an experiment. The usual way for doing that is to utilize what is called a single blind technique. A single blind technique means that the subjects in the experiment are not going to be aware 
of which research group they're in. Okay? So if we're trying to study the effects of a new drug, suppose I've developed an anti an adolescent anti-sex drug, and I want to know whether, in fact, it keeps the adolescent's mind off things other than uh, sex, from puberty to marriage. Parents would pay a lot of money for that kind of a drug. Um, they would fund my research if I were to study that. So in essence, what I would do when I gave the, the anti-sex drug to my research assistant and a comparable control substance, just as an aside, that control substance is usually called a placebo. It's a pill that looks like the one that we're studying, but it doesn't have whatever the extra ingredient is. It, it looks like it, it tastes like it, and so forth, and we give you instructions to take it at the same interval. But it doesn't have the, the ingredient that we think is causing the attention to be diverted to other things. So in that case, when I give those drugs in bottles to the research assistants to give to you, I have instruct them not to tell you which group you're in. That is, when the pills are given to you, you are operating blind. You don't know whether you're in the experimental or the control group in that case. You don't know whether you're in the experimental or the placebo condition. That is what's called a single blind technique. You, the participant, do not know which study you're in. That will control for demand characteristics because, in essence, they'll be equated out across both conditions. Even if you're biased either in favor of or against the drug, there's no way you can systematically bias the data or those effects will be neutralized out because you don't know whether you're in the experimental or the control group. But there's another problem, a second difficulty, a second error that we have to worry about, and that is what is called experimenter bias. Experimenter bias generates out of the fact that this is a human enterprise. Research is a human enterprise, and so we have to be careful to make sure that we are, are participating, um, that, that we're we don't introduce systematic bias into the conduction of the research. The easiest way to do that is, is to introduce what is called a double-blind technique. The double-blind technique uh, will control for experimenter bias. Um, Rosenthal, many years ago, did a classic study on that, uh, summarized in a book called Pygmalion in the Classroom, in which he was looking at the effect that teacher bias may have on, um, on their evaluation of students. Um, but more generally, the way to control for a double-blind technique, if I were doing this drug study of an adolescent anti-sex drug, what I would do in that case is, is to, when I gave the bottles of drugs to my research assistant, I would not tell him or her what the code was underneath the bottle to determine whether it was an experimental or control substance. And thus, when they gave the drugs to you, they also wouldn't know which group you were in. And therefore, the experiment would be conducted under what's called a double-blind technique. And that would mean when they collected the data back from you, even if in the worst of intentions they wanted to bias the results, they wouldn't be able to systematically because they wouldn't know whether you were in the experimental or the control condition. So in essence, a single blind study will control for demand characteristics. A double blind study will control for both demand characteristics and for experimenter bias. And so I would wait until all the data was collected until I told the research assistant, okay, on the eight number code on the bottom, the second digit in, if it's odd, means it's an experimental drug. If it's even, means it's a control drug. So separate the data on that basis. Now we can compare and see what we have by way of, uh, by way of research. The American Psychological Association has a very detailed set of data um, principles governing ethics in psychological research. The basic principles are in the simple psych book, and I'm not going to review them in detail there for you. But you have the right to informed consent when you start the experiment. You have the right to see a complete treatment of your data after the experiment so that you understand how yours, can, your data, your performance contributed to the overall effects that are being studied. And you have the right to complete privacy, to the assurance of privacy, unless you sign a release. At any time you feel uncomfortable, you are welcome to stop the study uh, and you will not be pressured to, to uh, continue in it at, at any time. So the, the usual, the only time somebody is likely to not fully inform you is if they're doing something like a, a, um, a psychological, a social psychological study where your foreknowledge of, of what's going to be done might impact how you'd behave in a given situation. In that case, after the fact, they will fill you in. Um, when they give you feedback on, on your performance. So the research is governed both with humans and with animals by very strict sets of, of ethical guidelines. Now so far we've been talking about the basic principles by which we uh, design experiments, specify stimuli and responses, uh, how we create control or comparison groups, and how we collect our results. Such steps usually lead to numbers. Numbers usually leads to confusion, and confusion usually leads to mistakes. To prevent mistakes, we've got to reduce the confusion. 
to reduce confusion, we've got to reduce the number of numbers. And to reduce the number of numbers, we've got to have a system. That system is statistics. Statistics can be misused, but only because they're misunderstood. And what I'm going to try and do is lead you out of the wilderness in terms of how statistics ought to be used. And in essence, what you should do is to consider statistics as an aid to, not a substitute for common sense. Okay? They should supplement your observational skills, not substitute for them. There's a really nice book that's about 75 years old written by Howard Huff called How to Lie with Statistics. And I wanted to start by giving you some examples from that book. It's very short. It's only about 75 pages long. It's a great afternoon read. But he's got just a marvelous array of examples in there about how statistics can be misused. Example, Henry G. Felsen once noted that with proper treatment, a cold can be cured in seven days. But left to itself, a cold will hang on for a week. Two, three, four. It's a switching of units without any difference in time being used. Crest, well, I should mention it, a well-known toothpaste, Crest, has for years advertised 26% fewer cavities brushing with Crest with Fluoristan or Fluoristat, whatever they're now calling it. And what they do is to typically, they, what they traditionally did, take you into a small town like Clinton, Tennessee, and they'd set up an experiment. 100 kids brushed with Crest with Fluoristat for three years, 100 kids brushed with Crest without Fluoristat, or whatever ingredient they were testing. Three years later, the dentist would come in, count up the total number of cavities in both groups, and make the comparison. And sure enough, there'd be fewer cavities in the experimental than in the control group. And they would thus conclude 26% fewer, or whatever the number was, 26% fewer cavities. I can show you how brushing with mustard would produce just as much of an effect, depending on how you do the research. The problem is, in that advertising, they don't give you enough information to actively interpret the results, because they don't tell you how many towns they actually ran the study in. So if I had a product that was as bad as brushing with mustard, what I would do as director of research is, I would run thousands of experiments with 100 kids in each of two groups all over the country, from Pocatello, Idaho, to Orono, Maine everywhere. And then what I'd do is to tally up the, the total number of, of cavities. I would subtract to get the difference and presumably we'd get, sometimes they'd be positive. The experimental group helped or the substance helped. In other cases it might be negative. It actually hurt producing fewer cavities. If we ran that experiment hundreds and hundreds of times, we would not find the same equal number of cavities each time. It's going to vary randomly from one sample to another. And so what I do is to take out of that entire 200 person experiment, I want one number, and that is the difference in cavity reduction. And I'm going to plot that on a distribution of cavity change. Okay? For each study, I'm just going to put an X on a curve. And what I'm going to find is a normal distribution. Sometimes the, the experimental substance wins, sometimes the control substance wins. If I'm trying to hype a product, I'm only going to interview in the towns where the effect was positive. I'll interview parents in the group where there were 27% fewer cavities on this distribution that might have actually settled on, centered on zero, where there was no effect. But if you only interview in the towns where there was a 27% cavity reduction effect, those parents will get on the Bible and swear there was 27% fewer cavities in their group, and they'd be right. The problem was that Crest did not show all of those groups at the same time. Now, the American Dental Association investigated the study, supervised the study, and in fact, it is a legitimate product. So I don't mean to dump on Crest, but the advertising was not correct. They only gave one example at a time, and they never told us how many of those studies were actually done. Highway stats are fun. There are four times as many accidents at 6 p.m. as there are at 6 a.m. Does that mean we should only drive to and fro at, at 6 a.m.? No, it means there are at least four times as many cars on the road at 6 p.m. There are more fatal accidents in clear weather than foggy weather. Should we wait for foggy weather? No. First of all, there are more cars on the road when, there's, when the weather's clear than foggy. And secondly, most people have enough sense to slow down in foggy weather so that even if they do have an accident, they aren't as likely to kill themselves. 80% of all fatal accidents occur within five miles of home. Turns out, for the average American, about 90% of all driving is done within five miles of home. That's not true in Houston. Because, you know, we are a large commute city, and the average commute is up in the low 20s in terms of miles you have to go. But if you think about it, I'll bet you your gas station, your food market, your drugstore, your barber shop or, or beauty shop, your cleaners are all with, located within five miles of your home. And each of those is a trip that fits into this category. The reason 80% of all fatal accidents occur within five, five miles of home is because 90% of the driving is done there. 
you're actually safer there than you are out on the highway. Business stats are fun. If I buy an article for 99 cents every morning and sell it for a dollar every afternoon, my profit is what on that 99 cents? Somebody get on the mic. I'm not going to do this all myself. What's the profit if I buy it for 99, sell it for a dollar? One cent, very good. <laughs> so I've got a 1% profit. I'm going to park that penny in a bank and I'm going to invest my 99 cents tomorrow morning to buy another article and I'm going to sell it to somebody else. I make another penny and I bank that. And if I keep that up for a year, what that means is that my earnings on my invested 99 cents is something over 365%. I will have $3.65 in the bank. And yet, I can look you in the face and say, well, my profit margin on what I've sold you is only 1%. And it's true. But keep that in mind when grocery stores tell you their profit margin is only 2 or 3% on what they're selling you. It is for that item, but they take that capital and reinvest it and sell you something else two weeks later. Add another 2 or 3%. So the net result is the average grocery store turns its entire stock about once every two weeks which is, in fact, if you think about it, exactly the way we want it. Because if you go into the grocery store to buy carrots, you do not want carrots when you're buying them in February that have been parked on that same counter since last July. You want the stock turning. You want fresh stock. So in fact, the average grocery store is likely turning a profit somewhere between 25 and 50, I'm, I'm sorry, 50 and 75 percent a year if they're turning their stock uh, 26 times a year and charging you a percent. They're up to 52, 54 percent. That's a pretty good profit margin. A favorite brought in by a student a number of years ago. For every VW sold in Italy, three Fiats are sold in Germany. That is comparing apples and oranges to grapes and bananas, if you listen. Because what they've done is compare the sales of one car in one country to the sale of a different car in a different country. There's absolutely no reason why they should be related to each other, and they aren't. If you go back and check, it turns out that Germans at that time bought more than three times as many cars as, as uh, Italians did. And the net result was that what Fiat was telling us was that they were second best in both countries. But you sure wouldn't know it from the, from the ads. The more races Wally Booth runs on Kendall Motor Oil, the more he wins. I love that one. Name for me the last race person who won a race without using oil. It might have been Mobile, it might have been Phillips 66, it might have been, you know, you name it. It doesn't matter. It's, it, it's irrelevant what the brand name is. If you don't have oil, you're not going to win under any condition. So now let's look at what we're talking about here. What we're going to look at are various types of statistics. And the first ones we're going to, uh, that I'm going to describe for you are what are called descriptive statistics. If I wanted to compare your class to another television class, one of the things I might do is to simply calculate the, the um, average SAT score for everybody in this class. That's one way to represent any given class is the average weight of the students, the average male-female ratio, uh, the average GPA, grad, grade point ratio of the students in class. Each of those is what would be called a descriptive statistics. So somebody asked me, um, um, you know, what's the GPA in your class? Well, I don't have to say, well, I've got one that's got a 1.6, I've got two that have a 2.1, I've got one that's, that would be listing the individual data. I can simply say the average GPA is 2.7 in my class or you know whatever it happens to be. So descriptive statistics essentially condense the data and simplify it for us. The second type of data that we can that we can look at is what's called inferential data. Those statistics are basically used after we calculate descriptive statistics and it's the inferential data that we use to make decisions about if we wanted to compare this television class to the last one or the next one. Now we're using the statistics inferentially if we're trying to decide which of several teaching techniques worked, we would compare across classes and we would then make inferences based on inferential statistics. And finally, the last type that I'd like to show you is what are called predictive or correlational statistics. Many uh, statisticians don't separate those. I do because the predictive statistics are partly descriptive. That is, correlations describe the nature of a relationship between two variables. But they can also be used for inference. That is, they can be used to make decisions um, with respect to them. Um, so I, I would argue that the, the predictive are, are a, a third kind of statistic that we can talk about. Now, in fact, I'm going to show you a series of very important terms. Okay, we're going to start with population. Okay, population basically is any group of people or animals or things or events or objects 
all of whom share at least one feature in common. You are a Democrat, you're under five feet tall, you weigh over 220 pounds, you're Italian, you're Catholic, you're Presbyterian, uh, you're, a, you're a Texan, you name it. You and I belong to literally millions of different populations. We can be categorized and divided into you belong, you don't belong, along many, many, many different directions. All of those are populations. And ultimately, when we conduct a study as psychologists, we are studying, we are trying to make inferences or decisions about a population. One of mankind's burning questions, is it true blondes have more fun? Blondes, in that case, would be our population. Okay? But we don't have enough money to go study all the blondes in the world. Be fun to try, we can't do it. So what we'll do is to select um, three Swedish blondes, we'll interview two Danish blondes, we'll find a blonde in Germany, we'll find two in, in uh, Rio de Janeiro, and we'll, we'll create a balanced representative sample, but we don't study the entire population. We will select from it, we'll randomly identify particular individuals to study, and that group, that subset, will become our sample. So a sample is basically any subgroup or subset, a collection, drawn from the population by an appropriate procedure. Usually we talk about random sampling or what's called stratified random sampling, but, but you don't have to worry about that. The net effect is that a sample is always smaller than a population. If it isn't, we don't even need the word population. Uh, I mean, we don't even need the word sample. We can just talk about the population. So in essence, anything we calculate relative to the sample is called an estimate. Do not be surprised by that word estimate. It is very precise. That is, if I wanted to know the average GPA in this class, I could calculate it to the 38th decimal place if I wanted to. I can very precisely calculate anything with respect to the sample. So it is an estimate, but it's an estimate of the corresponding value for the population. It is not in and of itself imprecise. So just because we call it an estimate doesn't mean that we're kind of, well, the ballpark figure is. No. We can calculate anything about a sample very precisely. And we use it then, as I've kind of anticipated here, to identify what is called a parameter. Any value that is true of a population as a whole is called a parameter. So in essence, in terms of the way we conduct this research, we start by identifying a population that we want to study. From that, we collect a sample. We select a sample. We draw a sample. We apply whatever measures we want to to that sample to create our estimate, and we use that estimate to make a guess or to narrow down what the actual population parameter is in a given situation. Now in terms of processing data, there's one other caution that I want to sound to you, and that is that basically when we have a graph like this, if you're the treasurer of a company and you have reported this set of data, it is important to label the axes because in this case, as you can see, if you look at it, the sales have had a rather disastrous 25-30% downturn between the winter quarter and the spring quarter. Now, if you're the associate, if you're the, the treasurer of that company, you may not be real interested in reporting these results because there's been a disastrous downturn. So in essence, what we're going to do is say, let's put those on a radial axis and see how they look. And in fact, now, are those two graphs technically equivalent? They, they include the same data, don't they? Yes. Are they psychologically equivalent? Not at all. Not at all. This one, eh, there's been a minor flattening of sales, but, you know, things will pick up again. That makes a 30% downturn look like a minor flattening of, of a growth curve, which, in fact, it isn't if you check the axes. So, in fact, the, the bottom line lesson to carry out of this is always read the axes. I can remember many years ago there was a, a um, soap product that was advertising itself, and in terms of the efficacy of its product, it presented a bar graph which said, basically, uh, here's product X, here's product Y, here's product Z, and here's our product, okay? And if you looked at the graph, there were no labels on the y-axis. So you had no way of knowing what was, the, what was the magnitude of the effect that was actually being measured in that, um, in that situation. So the bottom line is when you're presenting data, always label the axes, and when you're, um, when you're reading data, always make sure that you, you, you read the axes. Now, in read the labels, I should say. In terms of manipulating data, this is about the simplest way uh, in which to present data. This is what's called a histogram. 
Okay, it's basically a frequency distribution. This was a sample of weights that I collected uh, several years ago in a class um, where I asked each male undergraduate in the class to put his weight on a 3 by 5 card. Didn't need the name or anything, just the weight. And then I simply created a frequency distribution. So you can actually retrieve every single student's weight in this particular graph among the males that were sampled. There were two that, that were within 7.5 pounds of 115, which was the interval center. There were, what was it, five who were in the, in the range of 130, and so forth. So in essence, that is the simplest way in which, you can, in which you can tally data. We'll come back and look at this a little bit later, but the questions that I want to ask now are, how do we go about analyzing the data? That is, what do we do with that data to begin to turn it into quantifiable statistical data? The first thing that we want to do is to develop what is called a measure of central tendency. The name that you might typically apply to this is an average. But in essence, what we're really doing here is a measure of central tendency. The simplest of these is the mode. Okay? Here is one set of data that actually has three different modes associated with it. Okay? This is what you might call trimodal data, if you want to think about it. The mode is essentially an eyeball measure. The mode simply indicates what is the most frequently occurring score. And in normal distribution, it will be the center of the distribution. But here's a set of data where the modes actually differ. There are three different groups of data, each of which have a different mode. So the mode is simply a counting measure. How many, um, how many instances of uh, what is the most frequently occurring score? The second thing that we can do, instead of talking about the mode, is to measure instead the median. The median is a little bit trickier. Uh, it's slightly more sophisticated uh, mathematically. To do a median, what you do is to, to rank order the data, first of all, in, in terms of the men whose weights I put up and graphed earlier. If I wanted to know the median value, what I do is simply rank order the cards from the lightest to the heaviest male, and then I count total number that I've got, and then count to the midpoint. So the median is essentially the 50th percentile. So in order to calculate the median, on whatever data set you're working with, you have to rank order it from the, the highest to the lowest, or lowest to highest, doesn't matter. Uh, but you have to rank order it on a dimension, and then you count the total number you've got, and then count to midpoint. So the midpoint is the 50th percentile. Why might we use these? Well, let me give you an extreme example. Let's suppose that you lived in, in uh, I think it was Bentonville, Arkansas, if I remember, where Sam Walton lived. The first year he earned a million dollars with, with Walmart. The other ten families on the block, including yours, actually had annual income of only $10,000. So the IRS came around asking for annual earnings, and you reported $10,000 like nine of your neighbors. So those ten houses had a total income of $100,000, but the Waltons had an income of a million that year. So in those 11 houses, it was a total of $1.1 million, or $1,100,000. Divided by 11 means the average annual income there was $100,000. So you go down to the welfare office to get help from society because you're earning so little, and they throw you out of the office. They're laughing at you. Get out of here. The average annual income on your block is $100,000. That's because they're using the mean, which is the last one we're going to look at. In this case, when you have a, a data set that is extremely biased with one outlier, you don't use the mean. Because as we just saw in the extreme example, in 11 homes, one of which earned a million, 10 of which earned 10,000, the average, the mean income there is $100,000. And that doesn't really reflect anybody's income. It way underestimates Sam's, and it way overestimates everybody else's. To give you an example of how extreme an, a, an extreme data point can be, when Walton retired and ultimately divided his resources, his personal wealth, he was the richest person in the country when he did that division, and what he created were the three richest people in the country. He gave it, as I remember, to two brothers and a child, or two children and a, and a brother, or something like that. And in dividing his, his estate in thirds, it created the three richest people in the country. They were still off the end of the distribution. So in that case, you use the mode or the medium. The last kind of, of data technique that we might also use is what's called the mean. And the mean is collected in this, in this way. This is a, a formula that you're already familiar with. You've done this since, well, my son is in sixth grade right now, and he's actually calculating averages uh, among many other activities right now. This is a statistical formula that simply tells you the mean equals the sum of x's. The, the Greek letter sigma in statistics is what's called a statistical operator. It tells you to add all of the x values. So anytime you see a Greek letter sigma, 
That's a sum sign. It means add up or sum all of the x values, and in this case, divide by n. So you just add everybody up, divide by, by um, um, n, the number of scores that you got. That's what we did a minute ago with you and Sam Walton's income. We summed all the, the 11 x values, or, or salary values, divided by the 11 families involved, and we got the mean in that case. So the mean is the most sophisticated mathematical measure for, for detecting averages. But the problem is, it's not a problem, the, the fact is that the mean includes all of the values. And so if you've got one extreme outlier in a given set of data, you have to be sensitive to the fact that you don't want to use the mean. You want to use something else instead. Now, interestingly, if a distribution is symmetrical, if you have an absolutely normal distribution, the mean, the median, and the mode fall right on top of each other. Okay? Second thing we also need to know, let me give you a, a, a specific example here. Okay? So we've got the mean, the median, and the mode as, as our major measures of, of central tendency. Now let's look at another problem we have, to, we have to deal with. And that is, let's suppose I gave a class, I had a pop quiz today. Everybody in class got 30. You got 29. What will your letter grade be on that exam? If everybody else in class got a 30 and you got a 29, what would your letter grade be? I'm going to wait. It depends on how you grade it. OK. Within limits, what will it be? D is too optimistic. It'll be an F. You are absolutely the lowest person in class. 5,000 people took the exam. Everybody else got 30. You got a 29. That's a failing performance. That's an F. You're off the end of the distribution. Let's try another example. Class average is still 30, but the range now is from 10 to 50. We've got a, a 10 to 50 distribution. Class average is 30. You got a 29. Now what will your letter grade be? Yeah, probably a C. Okay? The average is identical. Your score is identical. But in one case, you got an F. In the other case, you got a C. And that is statistically defensible. Because what you have to be aware of when, you're, when, you, you, know, when you get a 29 on a test and your mom says, well, what's the average? Well, it's 30. The other question that your mom should also ask you is, what's the variability? Because the variability is the only thing that's changed. If you look at the example that we'll put back on the screen here now, you'll see that all three of the distributions there have the same mean, but they have vastly different variabilities. The tall middle one it has very little variability. The low flat one has a much greater degree of variability. All three of those sets of data actually have the same, uh, the same mean but they have widely different variabilities. So variability is another thing that we, have to be, that we have to be sensitive to. The simplest way to measure variability is to measure its range. To measure the range, what you do is to, is to simply take, well, it's actually very easy. You take the top score minus the bottom score, and you subtract it. OK, top score minus bottom score, and add 1. So in our example of everybody scored 30 and you got a 29, the range there would be 30 minus 29 or 1 plus 1, i.e. 2. That is, you could only score either 29 or 30 on that particular exam. So the range there would be 2. In the second example we had where the scores range from 10 to 50, the range would be 41. Top score 50, lowest score four, uh, 10, leaves 40 in, in the brackets plus 1 or 41. That's a very crude measure because, like in the Sam Walton example, the range on that set of income data would have been 990,000 because the, the Walton family was so far off the end of the distribution. Okay? Because of that, we have another measure that we can also use, and that is what's called the standard deviation. The standard deviation is calculated in this way. The formula is a little bit complex, but let me just walk you through it here. In essence, what it has is again that statistical operator. We're going to add up all of the quantities x minus m. x is the raw score, m is the mean. We're going to square that, divide it by n, and take the square root of it. I'm not going to burden you with having to actually calculate that, but I do want to show you an example so that you can see how easy it is to actually do what's required there. I've rank ordered the scores of those original weights that I collected, and they range from 115 at the lowest to 230 as the highest weight. 
That's in the first column. You don't actually have to rank order them, but I've done so so that you can see what's happening. In essence, we then calculate. We add up, divide by the number, and we get the mean weight, which for this sample is 166. That goes in column two. That's the mean column. Third column is x minus m. Now we've done everything we have to in the brackets. And we then do the next operator operation, which is to square it, as you can see in the formula down at the bottom. So the rightmost column is simply x minus m quantity squared for each individual value. That x minus m is basically a deviation measure. What it tells you is how far your score is from the mean. So you can see in that first score that, that's uh, where the weight was 115, that person was 51 points removed, 51 pounds removed from the class average in the low direction and thus has a negative number. Okay, but since we're dealing with average variation, the reason we square it is to get rid of the, of the uh, negatives there. But the, the person who weighed 230 was actually 64 pounds above the class average. So we've got a slight positive bias in this set of data. We square it, we add it all up, the sum x, we've got the entire numerator when we simply add up the right-hand column. Then we simply divide by the total number of weights we had, take the square root, and that gives you the standard deviation. I burden you with all that to ask you one question, and that is, if everybody in that sample had weighed 166 pounds, what would the standard deviation be? It would be a zero, exactly. Okay. What that means is that when you have zero variability, you have a standard deviation of zero. To give you an example, the typical exams that I give in introductory psychology range, the class average is about 30. It'll be between 25 and 30 points out of 45 questions that you answer. The range is roughly 15 to 45. Well, I'll say 42, not perfect, but roughly 15 to 45. And so the net result is that for my exams, what we find usually is that the mean is around 30 and the standard deviation is about 5. On the SAT, on the other hand, that you took, the mean there, does anybody know what the mean is for a, a, the morning section, say a math portion of the test? It's 500. The, the mean is 500. The standard deviation for that test is 100 by design. So in essence, basically, the, the wider the data ranges, the higher the standard deviation is. That's the best way to keep it in mind. There's no precise relationship until you work out the formula. But in essence, the bigger the standard deviation, what it's telling you is the more scattered the data is. We've got one other factor we also need to look at, and that is measures of skewness. Skewness has to do with how well distributed the data is or how evenly distributed the data is. One possibility is to have what is called a positive skew, which is what we see here. Um, I think I can go ahead and do that. Yes. Skew identifies the distance or the direction on the, on the distribution where you have a little bit of data. In this case, if we were to poll American families on average annual income, you will get the kind of curve that you see here. There is a positive skew to average annual income in the U.S., meaning that there are relatively few Sam Waltons in the country. There are very few people off the right end of the distribution as you're looking at it. So that is what's called a positive skew. A second possibility is to have what is called a normal distribution. And there, something like intelligence, for instance, is normally distributed. Intelligence is normally distributed. The normal distribution is symmetrical. If we drew a line right down the middle of the normal distribution, you can actually fold it over on top of itself. And the two lines will fall roughly on top of each other. That's a normal distribution. The third possibility is to have what is called a negative skew. Many years ago, I gave, the first time I ever wrote a television class, as a matter of fact, I woke up one morning and realized on a Tuesday I had to pass out a test, mail a test to everybody on a Thursday. So I made a mistake. I called the publisher of the text, and I had them send me a computer score, a computer-generated exam. I said, I want, they had, you know, a list of questions of their material. I said, okay, I want question 6, 13, 23, 66, 172, and so forth. And I went through the whole thing, and I got back the next day a nice package with, um, E uh, you know, FedEx to me of, of, uh, exa of, of the exam, which I then produced and sent out to everybody on Thursday. Deadline due back the next Tuesday. Imagine my surprise when I scored the data and discovered that, of course, it was an, an open book exam on an exam written by the publisher of the book. And, of course, they didn't know what I'd been talking about in lectures, so, of course, all the questions could be answered right out of the book. And the result was if you didn't have a 49 or a 50 on that exam, you didn't have an A. 
If you didn't have a 47 or a 48, you didn't have a B. And in fact, if you'd gotten 46 out of 50 right, you had a C in the class. You cannot imagine what hit the fan in that case. Students were calling the president's office, the president called the provost, the provost called the dean, the dean called the chair, and the chair called me in and said, the heck are you doing in that class? And I explained to him, as I've just explained to you, what had happened, and he simply put his arm around my shoulder and chuckled and said, well, write harder exams next time. So people are very willing to let you float the exam upward, you know, float the curve upward if everybody happens to score embarrassingly low. They'll always let you float it up, no argument, that's fine. But in fact, as a statistician, you now appreciate that I was equally legitimate in floating the grade, the curve downward when everybody jammed at the top. And statistically, there's no counter-argument to that. By exactly the same logic that we will float curves up, usually, we could have just as easily, with data like I was showing you, have floated the curve downward. Okay? Don't forget that. But I will write tougher exams in the future. Okay, let's jump on in here and get a start, at least, on looking at, at one of the more interesting um, features of statistics. Statisticians have many, many times looked at their data, and what they find is that, that the data collected by psychologists a vast number of times will fall in a normal distribution. You know, how high you and I will jump if we are startled is normally distributed. Our weight is roughly normally distributed. Our height, roughly normally distributed. Our run times on, on a hundred yard dash for males versus females is roughly normally distributed. And the result was that this quotes normal distribution kept coming up so many times that psychologists started studying it. And what they found out about that distribution was rather amazing. They found out that basically in a normal distribution as mathematically defined, you will have 68% of the data falling within one standard deviation of the middle. In other words, the mean plus or minus one standard deviation indicates or includes 68% of the data. If we go back to the example I gave on my test earlier, the, the kind of typical results that we get, what that means is that if in fact I gave an exam where the range was 15 to 45 and the average was 30 with a, with a five point deviation, what that means is that 68% of the students will score between 25 and 35. That is the mean plus or minus one standard deviation, okay? 68% of the data in a normal distribution falls within one standard deviation of the curve. Secondly, 95% of the data falls within two standard deviations of the curve. Okay? What that's saying then is that in a normal, if, if I've got a set of test data that is normally distributed as it usually is because of the size of the classes I teach, what that's saying is that 95% of the students are going to fall in my exams between a score of 20 and 40, where the average is 30 and the standard deviation is 5. 95% of the students will fall between 20 and 40. And finally, 99 and 3 quarters percent of the data will fall within three standard deviations of the mean. A very easy way to illustrate that point for you, and, and again, what that's saying is that essentially all of my students will have a test score between 15 and 45 on a normally distributed test where the mean is 30 and the standard deviation is 5. Put that in perspective for you in a slightly different but easy to document way. Think back to your high school and think how many people you knew personally who scored 800 on the SAT, say on the math section, okay? That is a rare event because the 800 is a perfect positive score. That means you're at the upper half of the distribution. 0.14% of the distribution falls in the upper quadrant, in the upper, you know, three standard deviations or more above the mean. And so the net result is that knowing somebody who scores a, um, a perfect 800 on that test is a very, very rare event. Now, while we've got this distribution on the screen, let me introduce one other concept. I just want to remind you again that we've got 68% of the data within one standard deviation of the mean, and we're not going to get to the other point I wanted to make. We've got 95% of the data within two standard deviations of the mean, and we've got 99 and three quarters percent of the data within three standard deviations of the mean. This same curve is going to become the basis for inferential statistics. If I were research director for Crest, I'm interested in how often do my data fall more than three standard deviations out 
That's the basis for inferential statistics we'll talk next time.